Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Great Conversations features prominent members of our world-class faculty engaged in compelling conversations with influential thinkers from around the globe. In today's fast-paced world, finding a reliable source of information for understanding complicated issues is a challenge. But audiences come to Great Conversations knowing that they'll hear thought-provoking analysis directly from the people at the center of the most complex and compelling issues of our time. Since its inception in 2002, we've met legendary individuals who have challenged conventional thinking, conducted groundbreaking medical research, resisted repressive regimes, and worked to preserve the world's fragile ecosystems. From artists and environmentalists to inventors and scientists, these fascinating discussions have demonstrated time and time again that the courageous actions of one committed individual can change the course of history. But Great Conversations is more than a celebration of the actions of a few fearless individuals. It's also a source of inspiration for our audiences. Armed with firsthand insights and informed analysis, they routinely come away energized, moved, and committed to make their own mark on the world. So won't you please join us for a great conversation? We'll save you a front row seat. Hirsch, it's great to have you with us. Uh, let's start back uh, 1969. This is your first big national story, uh, the My Lai uh, Massacre. Could you just remind us what the story was about and, and what, if any, contemporary significance you'd associate with it? Well, it was the end of innocence about us and war. we had all thought we'd gone through World War II. I was raised in Chicago during those years, and my sisters would take me to the war movies where our, our boys were always, you know, I had, you know, thumbs up, scarves around the neck, flying P-51s, and the Nips always had the, the hatch closed and were wearing funny little headgear and uh, squinted. And um, um, at a critical moment, um, uh, Van Johnson would be chasing Robert Ryan, and, and um, <laughs> uh, they'd be fighting about a nurse the next one day, and the next day Robert Ryan would save Van Johnson's life, and just before he, uh, 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 the Nip was going to kill Van Johnson, Robert Ryan would fire bullets, and we'd all cheer as the plane would go down, and we'd, uh, we'd hear the Ur! as the plane went to the water, and just before it hit the water, bullets had been flying into the cockpit, the nip of blood would come from the corner of his lip, and he'd hit the water, and that was it. That was the war for us. And it turned out that uh, we, uh, Americans, don't fight wars any better than anybody else. We dehumanize the other people. We've, that's just the reality of, of war, and it's one of the aspects of war in which, surprisingly enough, we don't do any better. So it was the, we got our eyes opened up to what war was about. And, and for that, um, um, uh, that's, that's something to be proud of, I think, in a way. Mr. Vice President, um, one of the themes that comes out of the uh, My Lai Massacre investigative reporting that Mr. Hirsch did was the cover-up on the part of the Army. Uh, it really takes courageous effort by one of the infantrymen and sending letters uh, to congressmen and others. When you think of back over this period um, and um, kind of a, a pattern of deception, and there's a, uh, maybe one of the most uh, revealing set of documents on this is from the Pentagon Papers, uh, which were uh, Defense Department documents up through 67. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg uh, leaks them in, in 71. And here's just an example of one of many. This is McGeorge Bundy National Security Action Memo from April 6, 1965, announcing that President Johnson has approved the increase of U.S. troops in Vietnam and actually changed the mission to a much more active footing. 
And after explaining this, these changes, Bundy concludes, quote, the president desires that publicity be avoided and actions should be taken in ways that minimize any appearance of sudden changes in policy and could be understood as being wholly consistent with existing policy. Is this kind of deception necessary to protect American interests? Well, in many ways, the Pentagon Papers are the most revealing document, is the most revealing document about the potential for vast government deception. It's in writing, it's clear. Uh, it was never expected to be exposed publicly. It was for candid discussion for history a long time down the road, but it was the story uh, which we've repeated later of getting into war where you didn't know what you were getting into. You didn't know the, the culture you were, presenting, you were invading. And the war turned sour and people became desperate and one of the first things that happens is deception. You have to tell stories, fibs, about what's going on to keep up public morale. You have to exaggerate the possibilities of success when your own troops know better. And usually a president's prestige is involved in these things. And it's, if there's one rule that I've learned after a long time of watching government is that it's always easier to get into a war than to get out of one. And I think we're finding that right now. 1974, you break uh, another big story. This one is on the CIA's family jewels. Could you remind us a bit of what the family jewels were uh, and whether there are any contemporary examples of them today? Well, the first part of the, the family jewels was simply a series in 1973 or 74. Uh, Bill Colby became, pre actually James Schlesinger, who had not been in the CIA, was appointed to run the CIA. And one of the things he learned that there'd been a lot of stuff off the books that he didn't know much about. So he asked for an internal study. And um, it was completed when uh, William Colby, who um, uh, was later famously described, he was a very, um, um, uh, um, uh, a religious, uh, he was a, a very devout Catholic, and Kissinger always accused him of uh, thinking he had to go to confession all the time. Colby, <laughs> instead of burying the documents, kept them going, kept the investigation going. I learned about him a year and a half before I, I could find out enough to get it published. I learned about him in early 73, and I kept on asking, and by the end of 74, I learned that, indeed, the, uh, at, the, at the request of Lyndon Johnson, the CIA, which was mandated by law, and ingrained in every CIA operative that you do not do operations in America. That's the FBI's purview. And you would destroy the, the, the trust in the agency, which does so many sensitive things abroad. And you can, one can argue so many important things abroad, theoretically. You don't operate. And they, it turned out they've been operating since 67 domestically against individuals and wiretapping, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a category of crimes that included an attempted assassination of foreign leaders. It was one hell of a mess that they were hiding. And um, um, I wrote a story about it that began uh, a series of investigation in, in which um, um, I, I, I want to say Fritz, but I'm going to say Mr. Vice President. <laughs> we always called him that back in those days. Oh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Vice President uh, had a major role in investigating later on the church committee uh, after 9-11. Uh, I haven't written about this yet, but the, the Central Intelligence Agency was very deeply involved in domestic activities against people they thought to be enemies of the state without any legal authority for it. They haven't been called on it yet. Um, that does happen. Um, right now, today, there was a story in the New York Times that, if you read carefully, mentioned something known as the Joint Special Operations Command, JSOC it's called, is a special wing of our special operations community that is set up independently. They do not report to anybody except in the um, Bush-Cheney days, they reported directly to the Cheney, Cheney office. They do not report to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or to Mr. Gates, the Secretary of Defense. They report directly to him. They are not, um, uh, they have absolutely no, uh, Congress has no oversight of it. It's an executive assassination wing, essentially. And it's been going on and on and on. And just today in the Times, there was a story saying that its, it's leader, a, a, a three-star admiral named McRaven uh, ordered to stop to certain activities because there were so many collateral deaths. It's been going in the, in, under President Bush's authority. They've been going into countries, 
not talking to the ambassador or to the CIA station chief and finding people on a list and executing them and leaving. That's been going on, well, in the name of all of us. Um, um, it's complicated because the guys doing it are not murderers, and yet they are committing what, about what we would normally call murder. It's a very complicated issue because they're young men who went into the special forces, the Delta Force that you've heard about, Navy SEAL teams, highly specialized, in many cases, the best and the brightest, really, no exaggeration, really fine guys that went in to do the kind of necessary jobs they think you need to protect America, and then they find themselves torturing people. And I've had people say to me, five years ago, I had one say, what do you call it when you interrogate somebody and you leave him bleeding and then you don't let him have any medical care and two days later he dies? Is that murder? What happens if I get before a committee? But they're not gonna get before a committee, I don't think. Speaking of committees, there is obviously some discussion in Congress about Truth Commission or uh, some other investigation. What's your view about that? Well, in a perfect world, it'd be great. Um, I, I can understand why President Obama wants to look forward because he's got so many issues on the table. And I'm not sure what kind of cooperation they would get. They'd have to uh, really get very, very tough. Um, with the executive, and I can just see a lot of reasons for a president not to want this kind of distraction. Mr. Mondale, let me uh, go back to uh, 1974. You've been in, Cong uh, in the Senate for 10 years, you know, almost 10 years, um, and uh, Seymour Hersh uh, runs this blockbuster story in, in uh, the New York Times. What kind of impact does that have on you? Well, it was, it was stunning because I had been in the Senate. I would never heard about uh, the family jewels or any of these uh, disclosures that were uh, printed in your story. It was on the front page of the New York Times and I remember uh, being on the Senate floor and John Pastore got up, raised this story and he said, this is not America, what's going on. We need to investigate this and correct the law and prevent it from recurring. And then the church committee was established I was uh, a member of that committee and I chaired the domestic task force, the part that looked in the domestic side that you mentioned earlier. And it was um, a life-changing experience to find out what happened. You know, you, the, the stories are endless, but um, for example, J. Edgar Hoover believed that Martin Luther King was a hate leader, a black hate leader and needed to be destroyed as a public leader. And, and they hounded Martin Luther King for a couple years, followed him, uh, planted stories on him, uh, uh, tried to get uh, uh, the King separated, uh, tried to get the Nobel Committee not to accept uh, King as a laureate, all sorts of stuff, and even one letter suggesting, I think suicide, that's the way I read it. And there were all sorts of things like that, mail openings, uh, uh, black bag jobs and so on, directed at uh, uh, dangerous Americans like Arthur Burns and uh, uh, Hubert Humphrey. And it, it was really, um, there was no end to it. And so we, we, the one thing that we did that I think really helped is we took your story and we were able to get into the government files, and we were able to kill all the rumors and all the suggestions, you know, that we were interfering with our nation's security, and in fact, establish a system that I think strengthened America, because it gave us a way of doing secret things that we had to do, but making it accountable to a court, federal court, that was uh, the FISA court, which was uh, secret and I and I really believed when we got through with that those hearings which were as you know very well covered and that we passed the the law the Security Act uh, and I think it passed the Senate by 96 to 1 because when the full record was there there was nothing you could do to say that this wasn't a real problem I really believe that once that was in place that we wouldn't have a problem again uh, in the memory of anyone alive at that time. But of course, we did. You went on to write an uh, award-winning and highly influential book called The Limits of Power that's about this paranoid, uh, destructive relationship between Nixon and Kissinger. Uh, 
And one of the, the, the core themes is about the uh, negotiations with the North uh, Vietnamese government. Could you talk a little bit about that, and particularly the, the, uh, the so-called secret plan that, that Nixon had worked out both with the North and then with the South? Are you talking about the Duck Hook plan or are you talking about later? You talk, there's, there were a number of secret plans. Kissinger, <laughs> this was of course one of the plans called for the use of tactical nuclear weapons in the war, which was very, very secret and that was uh, uh, astonishing. Uh, uh, the whole notion of conducting serious diplomacy with the North Vietnamese in secret, the whole notion of conducting uh, opening the China in secrecy, the whole notion that secrecy was essential for the day-to-day -day operations of the government, as the Vice President was mentioning, it, that it's sort of anathema, it seems to me, to what America is about. And, um, and almost, this is all pre-Watergate. And so you could almost understand this, this kind of thinking that the President uh, Nixon had and Kissinger abetted him. Uh, I don't know to this day why, uh, I just, my attitude towards Kissinger to this day is frankly that um, um, I know he's still considered with a great respect, but I still think basically uh, when the rest of us can't sleep at night, we count sheep and uh, he has to count uh, burned, and burned and maimed Cambodian babies in my book. I have no mercy for him because I think he helped perpetrate a, a, a policy uh, of secrecy that was, uh, as I said, uh, not only that it was counterproductive because there was always an agreement to be had on the table. That doesn't mean the other side was, was great. But you know, getting back to what you said about you thought it was over, and we all did in 1970. There was remember the Ryan Act, there, right. was there was very good legislation right. passed. Right. And so one of the things that we don't know much about, uh, I know you're gonna, I'm, I'm getting ahead of you about Iran-Contra, but I just want to say this, <laughs> that very early in the Reagan administration, very early, by middle of 1981, Bill Casey, and there was so much hostility among many conservatives and many former CIA, many people still in the CIA to the notion that Congress really was going to be an active participant and not just some paperweight, you know, flyover. That he began, we now know that Bill Casey began in the middle of 1981 cutting a deal with the Saudis to finance American covert operations so you didn't have to go to Congress. So it's, it's just amazing how quickly um, such good and um, there was nothing quite like, nothing no. has been like the no. church committee. No. I don't know if it will get anything out of this new truth commission either. That was an amazing, and I commend, you know, it's, it's, it's in the dung heap of history, the Senate Intelligence Committee report. But it's a document to me that's as important as the Pentagon Papers. It really is outlines. And it also was more, it, it also was, was prescriptive. It also gave ways to, to, to treat the problem. It wasn't simply like legislators will. They'll describe the problem and then they describe the way legislation to fix it. And here comes the next administration and within a year of taking office, they're already finding ways to undercut the Congress. So we really have, um, uh, I don't know what the framers would do with what happened to the, that we really, it's really amazing to me that we've managed to get such bad leadership so consistently. <laughs> I'm just appalled. I think there's an important point about all these examples, and that is that we tend to uh, think about those secret agents that are misbehaving, about those FBI agents that are out um, uh, on their own. But in fact, most of these serious uh, scandals that are disclosed involve a president or a person around the president. They're often acting under direct or indirect orders from the White House. Not always, but very often. You bet. We'll never fully know. I can say this as somebody who's, who's been writing from inside the White House in some, to some degree in the last eight years. I know a lot about Cheney's operation, but I know almost nothing about the relationship between Cheney and Bush. And I don't think we're really going to come to understand it at all. But anyway, we're ahead of you. <laughs> um, Mr. Mondale, uh, Seymour Hirsch concludes this book, Limits of Power, and I want to ask you about how you think about the limits of power. Uh, and, and he's got this very striking uh, concluding uh, section in which he says, quote, neither Nixon nor Kissinger ever came to grips with the basic vulnerability of their policy. They were operating in a democracy, guided by a constitution, and among a citizenry 
who held their leaders to a reasonable standard of morality and integrity, close quote. Did our constitutional system work in holding Nixon accountable? Yes, and you've said that earlier, and I think uh, that's the great hope, that despite how we've abused it, with time, the Constitution works. The public starts smelling something and worrying about it. And the courts are, be, are able then to begin with cases. And the Congress starts finally responding to these challenges and holding hearings. And, and uh, politicians start worrying about their responsibility and things start changing. And, and I hope as we go through these tough stories that, that we remember that this constitutional system has proven itself time and time again in a very positive way. The idea of sharing power, the idea of accountability of power, the idea of checks and balances, the idea of accountability to the courts and to the American people was a bold thing to do when we started, and it's been fully vindicated, I think, by our experience since. Despite disappointments, it's, it, many of the president has thought that he can work around that. It's just a sort of a, a barrier to a strong presidency. But they, if they do, they always in the long run find out that the system is stronger than they are. Do you think the system has worked when you kind of look back over eight years and what uh, the uh, Bush-Cheney uh, presidency accomplished? Uh, well, there's no question corrupt presidents are very good for me personally. There's just no question about that. Um, no. And, but I, I know where the vice president's coming from because, as, as it was remarked earlier, we did have an electoral process. We had to go... It almost was inevitable that Bush had a win in a way because unless we went to the bottom, unless we got to the absolute bottom, the public... If he had lost that election to Kerry, it would have been very hard for Kerry to, to, to believe it or not, I think, to, to run the government because there would have been so many people feeling that he had usurped what George Bush had done. So we had to, in a funny way, play it out. I mean, history will look at that election maybe differently because we, we, we had to get to the, as I say, to the bottom of the pit so that you could overwhelmingly elect a Democrat. And George Bush can't raise money, for example, for, for his library right now. He's having trouble raising money, which is great by me, anyway. <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, um, but, um, but there's no question that if somebody had asked me, um, those words you, you, you read, I wrote in 83 when I finished that book, if somebody had told me that we not only would have had an Iran-Contra, uh, but we would have had um, after 9-11, we would have had a president using fear um, to uh, generate um, uh, 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 what they did after 9-11. And I, I, I am doing a book on some of this stuff, and I'll get into it in more detail. And there was things I, I know, like what I mentioned earlier about the JSOC, they were hard to write. Some of the stuff I know was hard to write in real time because of people inside. You had to sort of figure out how much you could say and measure it and check with them. You didn't want to put them in jeopardy. Uh, some, uh, but in any case, I think what they did was extra extraordinary in this way. Um, Bush, Cheney is always, as, as you and your class and, 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 and your syllabus has made clear and what your students are reading um, um, in the class that you're, you, you, you guys are uh, jointly teaching, uh, you, you're going back to Hamilton. You're going back to the, uh, the unitary presidency and Cheney has been sort of the archetype, the, the driving force of that. Um, uh, how to describe what they did that's different. They came in hating Congress. They wanted to overcome uh, congressional oversight. They just didn't outmaneuver it or outwit it. They set about, and using the language I'm going to use, they set about in the inside about talking about how to sabotage oversight. And what is the model for sabotaging oversight? The model turned out to be the Bill Casey model. The Congress's hold on, in the Constitution over the executive is m about money. Everything that's being spent and defenses must be approved by the Congress, even the most secret operations. There are secret committees in Congress that review it. And so the, the, the answer was, let's run operations off the books. Let's find money elsewhere and the hell with Congress. And it was talked about as this is the way to finally put those creeps in place. The contempt for Congress in the Bush-Cheney White House was extraordinary, just extraordinary. And it came out of Iran-Contra, the same idea, that scandal that was in the 80s when if 
you know, that, um, well, I think you're probably the best person to tell the audience exactly what it was. You've studied it more carefully than anybody else here, perhaps. Iran-Contra was the uh, episode in American history where um, Ronald Reagan actually negotiated with terrorists, uh, with the Iranians who uh, had uh, uh, their satellite uh, group in, uh, in Syria were holding some of our uh, CIA personnel hostage and other hostages. And part of the negotiations was to trade arms with the Iranians. The money that was then funneled to Nicaragua to uh, support the uh, rebels trying to overthrow the Marxist uh, elected government in uh, Nicaragua, despite the fact that there was a law known as the Boland Amendments that had been passed by majorities in Congress, presented to the President Reagan, who had signed it. And so what Ronald Reagan was doing, or his White House, was violating both a policy agreement, you don't negotiate with terrorists, and you certainly don't negotiate with the Iranians, but secondly was violating the Boland Amendments, which had prohibited by law the uh, support of uh, the uh, Nicaraguan uh, rebels. The critical thing about Iran-Contra um, was that, um, as you said, that they were explicitly barred from using money and they went around. They tried, they were selling arms, the Israelis were involved in this, they were selling arm, arms for a profit, taking the profit and the thought was to invest it. So after um, uh, Elliot Abrams, it was also one of the people who later was, uh, I think he pleaded nola contende to a couple of, of offenses or was found guilty, I'm not sure, it's, it, he didn't serve time. Uh, misprison of, of a felony, he didn't tell the truth to Congress. Um, Elliot Abrams was also involved, who became a key player in, in the Bush-Cheney White House so what makes uh, Bush-Cheney so interesting is that at some point um, they had a meeting after 9-11 of the people who were in, in the White House who worked in Iran-Contra. That would be Abrams and Cheney. And there were others involved who were also in the White House involved in, and they, they had a meeting of lessons learned. What I'm telling you literally took place. They had a, a little meeting of a small group of people who worked for Reagan and for George Bush when he was vice president, his father, um, uh, George, uh, President George, uh, George Herbert w uh, Walker Bush, I guess, isn't it? Anyway, um, uh, and at the meeting, here were some of the conclusions that the Iran-Contra thing, despite the disaster, proved you could do it. You could run operations without congressional money and get away with it. The problem, the reason they got exposed, and this is what was said in the White House, that there were too many people that knew too much. Too many people in the military knew what we were doing in 85, 86. Too many people in the CIA knew. And Oliver North, who all, many of you might remember, the, the great witness he was, and, um, uh, was the wrong person to be running that. So what you do is you tell nobody. Cheney, this is one of the things Cheney wrote in his minority dissent to the uh, uh, Iran-Contra committee. Cheney said, my God, Reagan was telling uh, uh, too many people too much. Don't tell Congress anything. You don't tell the CIA much. You don't tell the, the, uh, the military very much. And you, Mr. Vice President, you're the Ali North for this. We're going to run operations off the books, and you're going to honcho them. And this is what they did. And this is what is still left to be reported, this kind of stuff, this kind of extraordinarily contemptuous attitude towards the... Uh, Constitution, but in the belief, the Cheney belief, Cheney's really bright. Cheney's a bright person in, um, um, in the belief that they were carrying out the Hamiltonian notion of a unitary president. I mean, in a profound belief they were doing the right thing. No mens rea, in other words, no sense of guilt. But let me just walk you through the arc that it appears your career followed. You have uh, My Lai, which, right. which breaks, and uh, it's the end of the Age of Innocence, and uh, you expose this um, you know, horrible massacre, um, and there's a, you know, some consequences that flow from it. You do the family jewels, and uh, you've got leaders in the Senate, uh, led by uh, Mr. Mondale, who pick it up. They do just a remarkable investigation, without historical precedent, to this day. Uh, you, you pass. Don't forget who else is in the Senate, though. I mean, we were talking about this yeah, earlier. Yeah. But Phil it, Hart, I mean, it was an amazing yeah, crowd. Yeah. It was an amazing crowd, uh, and, and you've got legislation that comes out of it. You've got the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or the FISA. Uh, the two committees. You've got, you know, other things coming out of it. Two committees. You've got, uh, then you've got, you know, kind of skipping ahead here a little bit, you've got the Iran-Contra controversy, which, you know, I think many people now do view as a significant uh, 
constitutional um, uh, crisis, but there was you know, a blowback to it, and there were some pretty significant uh, hearings and um, exposure to it. And then you get the Bush-Cheney years. And, and really what strikes me in listening to you is how fragile and vulnerable the constitutional system is, despite the fact it's been around for over 200 years, despite uh, the many strengths of the system, that you could have such a small number of people in a clandestine way running, uh, you know, in some cases, an off-the-book operation. Are you struck with the vulnerability of this system? There was a, another element that happened here that was very depressing, and that was the collapse, I think, of the mainstream press. And, and it, it's hard for me to talk about it because it's so, so much like this, you know, worked all those years. Um, uh, I obviously was lobbying very hard. I know a lot of people at the New York Times, a lot of people at the Washington Post, and there were wonderful reporters in both places. James Risen, who wrote the, the first story about the, uh, about the, the secret uh, wiretapping and, and surveillance of people. Um, Dana Priest, who wrote about in the Washington Post, and uh, who wrote all those stories about uh, detentions. Uh, but what happened in the major newspapers is they joined the team. And um, I, I know this as somebody who was talking to my peers, my fellow Walter Pincus at the Washington Post, people, and in both places, the newspapers will never want to admit this, but the, the, the message was passed to their investigative reporters, we're not picking holes. We're not attacking them right now. This is an 02 and 03. There were a lot of questions to be asked journalistically about Bush's statements about WMD, about the weapons of mass destruction. And I can tell you right now, throughout the government, there was not total acquiescence in the notion that the Iranians, Iraqis were, were that far along because we had done so much bombing in the first Gulf War in 1991. And also there had been a very extensive series of investigations by the, uh, the United Nations inspection team known as UNSCOM. The, the inspection team, um, some of you might remember the name uh, Marine Major Scott Ritter, and uh, a very aggressive a bunch of people. Ralf Ikeas, the Swedish, was the Swedish diplomat, was the ambassador. And the UN team went into Iraq beginning in uh, this, uh, right after the end of the war in 91 and spent the next seven years there, six months a year there. And they ended up concluding that we had totally demolished any, any significant nuclear facilities. And they wrote a long report in 1997. It was, it was on the internet, it was small type, 400 pages, uh, two, Brits, two Brits wrote it, one of them was an intelligence officer. And if you went around, as I did, and talked to those people, you came away by, by the end of 19, 2002 saying, these guys are nuts about WMD, it's just not there. There's nobody that, who has any first-hand knowledge that believes he has a weapon system at all in place. And it turned out he did not. It turned out he may have been his own worst enemy, but we didn't do the job, and I say we collectively, because we, the press, um, I, I think uh, um, uh, Jefferson, you know, who was the great First Amendment man, he, he, you know, any cliche you want, rolling over in his graves, we did not challenge the president. We joined the team. We became jing jingoistic. It was very hard not to be. It was very hard not to, after 9-11, not to be, uh, uh, want payback. We wanted to bomb. Everybody wanted to bomb Afghanistan. And, um, uh, 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 Mr. Mondale writes in his book that was published in the 70s about the notion, and we talked about this, the notion of the public having responsibility too. We're not, this is, you know, you talk about secrecy, but so much of this stuff is there. And the classic example of, of why what he said was so prescient is in the fall of, if you all remember John Walker Lynn, the Taliban kid, the 18-year-old kid from, Caliban, uh, from California, who... Uh, um, his parents split. He was unhappy. He, he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't uh, smoke the hookah and, um, you know, drop out of school. He learned Arabic and joined the Taliban as to act out. I mean, a pretty strange way to act out. But anyway, he's picked up in Iraq. He knows English. There's an incredible scene where a guy, a Marine who later was killed, ex-Marine in the, in the CIA, on camera, which is against every rule of the intelligence agency. We had a lot of people there that were tyros, that were newly trained uh, in, the, in the field. In, in front of a camera, he asked this fellow, this, this American kid, who's been speaking Arabic as a Taliban for eight months to his peers, he asked him in English because he knows he's American, so I was asking him a question. And of course, John Walker Lynn won't answer him. To, uh, to say he knew English would get him killed by his people. He would be a spy for them because, oh my God, he's been with us for eight, eight months speaking Arabic. He ends up getting, there was a shooting, the, 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 uh, the soldier gets, the ex-soldier, the Marine gets killed, the 
public's very, very angry about this. It's on, it's on C-SPAN or CNN. He's thrown into a prison. Other, other, other soldiers can come and throw uh, feces and urine at him. He has a bullet in, his, in him for five days. It's not really removed. All in front of all of us. I mean, the treatment of him violated uh, how many different protocols of the Geneva Convention? Uh, many of them. He was absolutely treated in violation of all international law, and nobody said a word. It went down. The John Walker Lynn story is, for me, very instructive. And it's, uh, I'm not suggesting there's a commonality of guilt, but there is a sense that if the public had responded differently, um, if the Republic hadn't joined in in fear, anger, wanting payback, we might have had um, uh, even the Bush Cheney crowd might have been a little less, a little more reticent about doing the stuff they did. I think that uh, willing administration is worried about appropriations, but I think they're worried about appropriations because usually that's followed up with oversight. And by getting the money somewhere else and trying to avoid the provisions of the Constitution that said no money can be spent except through appropriations, they somehow think they're going to escape responsibility. But I don't think they use it with time. The, it, it leaks out and they're accountable. And I think the thing that a willing administration most fears is public understanding of what's going on, the facts. Um, uh, Jay Rockefeller, the chairman of the, in, of the Intelligence Committee a few years ago said, there's a distinction between oversight and undersight. He said, oversight is when you know enough to ask the questions. Undersight is when you do not know enough to even ask the questions. And I think when the Congress is in that position, the press is in that position, we just don't know how to get our handle on something because we don't know enough. That's when the country's in trouble. That's when the system doesn't work. And that's why the press has to function. That's why the Congress has to function. And why we have to look at the unique role of the vice presidency under Cheney because a uh, vice president is in a unique constitutional position. They're both in the executive and the legislative branch. No one else is. Uh, Cheney was always playing this game. If you tried to get him to respond because he's in the Congress, he said, no, I'm in the White House. And if you tried to get him an answer you know, in the executive branch, he said, no, I'm a president of the Senate. And you never got an answer out of him for eight years. And so they ran a government within a government out of the White House accountable to no one. And I think that's an example, a precedent that should be worrisome. Now, Mr. Mondo, I just want to ask, you, you, you raised uh, uh, the, the particular role of Vice President Cheney. Um, many historians and students of um, the Vice Presidency and the Presidency single out your term as Vice President as the game changer. Before that, the vice president waited around for the president to die, basically. Um, and, uh, and if that happened, they stepped in. And, and when you came in, there was a very special understanding with uh, President Carter. Uh, you got all the information. Your staffs were integrated. Uh, you were going to the meetings. Um, is there some concern on your part that Dick Cheney is a culmination of what you may have started? <laughs> No. <laughs> you know. uh, I, I, I've, I've been asked that because we executivized the vice president. We brought him out from the cold and put him in, in the White House, and I think it really worked. Uh, but it went off the rails under mm -hmm. Cheney, and, and I think it's something we really have to study carefully, which is why I hope the Congress will look into this and provide a report because those precedents are dangerous. You say, well, that just happened once. And then my experience in government is if it's happened once, it's a precedent, it's like a loaded pistol that you leave on the dining room table. It's dangerous, and you have to deal with a dangerous precedent. You know, I read a bunch of papers today. You gave me a bunch of documents that, were, that you discovered in the, uh, uh, in the Carter Library about his term as vice president, and I read a lot of them this afternoon. The, your meetings in the, in South Africa and in Europe. Uh, they weren't in South Africa, mostly in Europe, weren't Vienna, they? Yeah. With the South Africans and also in China. And the thing that was interesting in reading them, you were very active, but there was complete sort of uh, 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 transparency. Uh, everything, you, there was this incredible volume 
of paper that your office produced and that was sent to everybody else. It was sent to the, the State Department, it was sent to the President, it was sent to other offices. There was none of the, you know, the, I know you were just making a rhetorical point in saying that there was no notion of, of any uh, uh, consolidation of, of power above and beyond that was granted. And it was a different use. It was a much oh, yeah. more energetic use of you, oh, yeah. which was interesting. And that's, that's the model. I mean, in a way, you can argue that would be the role model uh, for how to use a vice president instead of, um, uh, um, uh, not so, it's not so much Bush Cheney. Most of the time, I, 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 I don't think George Bush was much of a vice president to uh, Ronald Reagan in that sense, you know, uh, his father. Uh, I, I, um, they were all caught up in Iran-Contra. Um, I don't think you can make a case for any precedent, for anything um, that Bush Cheney really did. I just don't think you can. I think they were so completely different. Mr. Mondo, let me come back to you. You wrote uh, what I think is a um, very important book, uh, The Accountability of Power. And in it, you said, our task is, quote, to acknowledge the importance of presidential power but to insist on the greater importance of accountable presidential power. And we've been talking about you know, this arc from uh, the Vietnam War, started yeah. in, in a big way by Lyndon Johnson with his escalation of troops, 10,000 over a half a million, uh, through the Nixon and then Reagan and Bush years. I'm wondering, have you rethought a bit about this argument about uh, 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 the accountability of power? Should we rethink the idea of, of presidential power? Do we want a weak president? Is, no. Should that be the conclusion we take out of the, the Bush-Cheney years? This, you know, is this know. the new time point? We need a strong president. The system requires a strong president. The world we're in, we can't do without a strong president. But I think the history of these scandals have all had the same result. It's produced a weak president. The fact of it is these abuses destroyed the Bush-Cheney administration. They destroyed Lyndon Johnson. When, when they go down that road, it weakens the presidency. It doesn't strengthen them. Um, I, had, I got an old speech I gave I thought I'd bring with me today. And it was a letter to the president in 19-something, giving him advice on how to be a president. This, I think, was to Bush. And I said, Mr. President, you must never abandon your office, your oath to faithfully execute the law of the land. Your job will be horribly frustrating. Congress, the press, the courts, your cabinet, our allies, the embassies, practically everything will frustrate you. At some point, you'll be tempted to break out of the constraints by resorting to private government outside the law. You will be told that you can achieve by covert and extra legal means what you cannot do openly and legally. The problem is it just doesn't work that way. And you'll be told that no one will ever find out about it. This is caught, occurs to every president, and my advice to you, President, don't do it. You can't keep it a secret if it's significant. It has never worked in the past, and I don't believe it ever will. If what you're doing will offend public opinion, its disclosure will doubly, be doubly offensive because you've not only covered up, but what you're doing is outrageous and people will never forgive you for it. I think there's a strong, repeated lesson in modern history that this stuff ruins the president. When did you write that? Uh, uh, 87. Really? So it's amazing. yours. You can go with it. No, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I think this is a very important theme. Yeah. When you think about uh, this notion of accountable power, though, and you think about the last eight years and, let's say, you know, the, the, the last part of the, the Bush presidency, what do you think of the job that the democratically controlled uh, Congress did in terms of checking the, the president? I think they were slow to get to it. Uh, they took the Congress back in 06. Uh, the committees did get stronger. The record of the Congress before that, uh, someone called it the broken branch. They were compliant. The investigating committees never investigated. They rarely met. They didn't pass many laws because the executive took care of it for them. And uh, one of the reasons the Democrats got elected in 06 is the public sensed this, and they wanted checks and balances. They wanted uh, a Congress that would produce oversight.
but I would say it got off to a slow start, and maybe because we were damaged. But some leaders developed, and I won't, like Henry Waxman, uh, Pat Leahy, and there are several others that are good, but that really knew what the Congress should do and began to organize the Congress and make it much more effective. Uh, I think they've done better this time, but they've got, got a lot of work to do, and they'll be tested on this, this issue. Thank you. Um, I want to go into a different uh, topic, and, and it's, it, it's kind of the tension between the First Amendment rights to free speech, free press, and generally public disclosure, and national security issues. Um, both of you, in different ways, have kind of been on the horns of that dilemma. When you were, in effect, running the church committee on the domestic side, there were a lot of critics who warned that public disclosure would undermine American national security. And a lot of your reporting, uh, seems to me I've read some quotes from senior administration officials referring to you alone as a national security threat. Um, <laughs> and I'm wondering how you think about this tension. Is public disclosure, even of... Uh, uh, government secrets, a threat to our security as a country? Um, I think there are secrets that must be kept. I think that uh, there's a zone of privacy around the present in normal matters. But I think as the Nixon wiretap case, or the, the uh, Nixon list case demonstrated, there's limits to what a president can protect himself from in terms of the public process. And I think when it comes to fundamentals, the Congress under the Constitution has the, the ability and the responsibility of oversight, of checking and balancing, and holding the president accountable, just as the courts do, and, and if the American people know, as they must uh, do also. So I think that's the system that was intended uh, in the uh, Federalist Papers' wonderful document, uh, Federalist Paper 51. And Madison wrote that this the idea of this Constitution is to pit ambition against ambition. If men were angels, we wouldn't need this sort of thing. Uh, but because we're flawed, because human beings will make mistakes if they're in positions of unaccountable pillar power, we must have auxiliary precautions. In other words, this is a system that trusted human nature and was distrustful at the same time. It's, it's a paradox, but I think it's that tension that's, that's allowed America to grow and solve its problems. Did it strike you that, that the disclosure in a public way would uh, threaten the country's stability and security? We, we worked very hard on that. There were things we never disclosed and never wanted. For example, agents' names. Okay, we never wanted to get in means or methods. There are many, many things that the committee agreed you know, we didn't want to hear about it. We didn't want the names. We didn't want any testimony. We got criticized once falsely for having exposed an agent in Athens, but we had not done that. Um, but my answer to that was to know everything we said publicly was solid. And the facts surrounding what we said spoke for themselves. Because in that way, we stripped the argument that we were trying to run down American security and instead showed Americans how by living by a better law and a different process, we could be stronger and save ourselves from these kinds of embarrassing. So, and I think we carried the public on that uh, because we were able to get in uh, side and get the facts and so on. So that's the way I handled it. I think a Congress that's compliant, it doesn't ask a question, weakens the country. And uh, that's, that's an essential part of their job. Mr. Hirsch, you are uh, front lines of of uh, receiving a lot of information uh, from all different sources. Um, how do you think about this, this kind of, uh, what's your role in balancing public disclosure and, and your genuine concern about the country's security? You don't publish everything you know. That'd be no, no responsible person. Every secret, there, there are secrets worth keeping. Um, um, uh, Mr. Mondale's talked about embarrassing facts, or facts that if they became known would embarrass the government. That's the kind of issue you get. And I can tell you at the New York Times, there were many times we received information and we decided, you know, and it's, it's a funny world we live in because basically the First Amendment is very clear, the Jeffersonian uh, First Amendment, which is basically it's their job to keep it secret and our job to find out. And there's nothing in America 
There's no bar in the United States to publishing any information, unlike any other country. Yeah. We were talking earlier about even in England, there are bars. So we really have an incredible system in the United States. That's, uh, um, there's nothing like it, I think. It's the most democratic form, and the First Amendment is so pure. So we would, at the New York Times, often my editor when I worked there for critical years was uh, A.M. Rosenthal, and he would sometimes, he would sometimes say, it's where I, what I feel about this in the stomach. But in general, what happened is, in general, the kind of information you get about operations come from people inside who have tried to change or stop something they think is crazy. I mean, literally, they think is dangerous. And these are the people who, in desperation, I'm talking about well-meaning people, will go to a reporter and say, here's what I know, in the assumption that I'm also going to do the work on it to get it more rounded and get more information and insulate him, the person giving me the information. And in general, what happened is, um, I can say at the New York Times in particular, less th than in the Bush Cheney years, um, uh, the president or, or the national security advisor or Henry Kissinger would call up um, sometimes my editor, A. Rosenthal, sometimes the publisher was Arthur uh, Punch Salzberger, and they would say, if you publish this story you know, tomorrow morning, uh, it'll be a grave national security issue. And in every case except once, uh, we decided to publish, and you know, uh, son of a gun, you know, the, uh, uh, the commies weren't parachuting into San Francisco the next morning. <laughs> and so in each case, they were exaggerating the danger. What we would do, and what I did in some cases involving CIA people along the, along the line you made, we, we would say, uh, we're not gonna publish this for five days. Get your people out of there. They don't belong there, they have no business doing what they're doing, get them out, it's your call. And you know, the classic case that was said during the, the legal debate about the Pentagon Papers in which the court, as you know, the Supreme Court upheld the New York Times publication yes. of the most top secret document you'll ever want to see uh, in the Pentagon Papers. And in the argument at one point, Alexander Bickel was the New York Times lawyer, the famous Yale professor of law. And at one point during the, the, the colloquy, one of the justices asked him, suppose you had, you know, he was talking about the right to publish anything, and somebody said, suppose it's 1915 or 1916, and we've got a, a, a troop ship full of doughboys going out to, to France, and we know, you know that the, the, the German U-boats are outside the harbor, as they were in those days, at the end of, later, 1917, in World War II, should that be a time you don't publish? Is that a time when this prior restraint is appropriate? And Alexander Pickell said, yes, that would be a case in which we should not publish. And what I would say, as a non-lawyer, I would say, no, no. The argument is, if we know it, they must know it. Publish it and make them change the day and keep the secret better. That's another <laughs> argument I would have made in court. I'm serious, I would have said, publish and say to them, hold that ship, find another day, and do it better. Because that's another, I think, rational response to that kind of a question. So prior restraint, it's complicated. You know, one more thing I was going to say to you about presidents and this yeah. thing that I had, a, I had a CIA director once say to me, you can't understand what it's like for the president. He gets in the office and he thinks, my God, I'm the most powerful guy in the world. And he's got, he's got the Congress and he's got <laughs> his staff and he's got the National Security <laughs> Advisor fighting and he's got everybody fighting yeah. and he can't get anything done. Right. Uh, he's got his wife yelling at him about something she wants. And he, all he can do is take a walk in the Rose Garden with the CIA director yeah. It's done. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the most attractive thing in the world. Yeah. I can take a walk in the Rose Garden, just the two of us, and I can get something done. And Some, he thinks. He thinks. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. He yeah. thinks. And somehow you find out about a lot of those walks in the Rose Garden. Um, and I'm wondering you know, about some of the uh, re more recent stories you've run uh, and whether you've thought about this balance between public disclosure and national security. One of the stories you broke was about American covert operations in Iran. Um, and I think most people would recognize that the potential of Iran developing a nuclear weapon is, is something that would be of little concern. And that's a real threat both to our allies and, and, and to our own interests as a country. Was there a moment when you thought disclosing uh, these efforts would either put the covert forces in danger or would hurt the country's interests? What, what what the story was, you're talking about a story last summer in which um, uh, the, the leadership, the Democratic leadership of the Congress said okay to a secret appropriation of up to 400 million. I don't know how much actually was spent. I know that was the amount in the authorized for operations inside Iran by the, the same unit uh, 
um, um, uh, Joint Special Operations Command. And the reason they had to go to Congress is the CIA was involved too, and the CIA refused to do an operation without money from Congress. They wouldn't go with the joint, they wouldn't go with outside money. They'd learned their lessons. And so they had to go get a finding. And they, they had to go under the law, they then, the CIA had to get permission. And what they, what they did is they went before the uh, House and Senate Defense Appropriations Subcommittees, a very small group in the, uh, in the House. It's uh, John Murtha and uh, of, uh, Obia, the Democrats on it, just four members. And they went before them and they said, I'm not saying anything that I didn't write, maybe a little in, more directly here. They said, we want permission to, uh, to have uh, defensive lethal authority. Defensive lethal authority inside Iran. What do you mean? Well, in case our guys get caught, we want to be able to shoot our way out. Well, I have to tell you, the Congress, the legislators were far from convinced that was the truth, because of course you have the right to shoot your way out. So what were they doing? I think I can tell you now that one of the initial goals was, and you can decide for yourself whether this is in, in the kind of practice that you want the Americans to do. They were going to try and snatch an Iranian nuclear scientist inside Tehran and get them to come to America and tell the truth about how far along they were in the bomb, on the assumption that they were much farther. You, you, the, the audience here should know that the official estimates of the United States intelligence community, uh, 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 in total collaboration with all 16 major elements, in, published in December of 19, uh, 2007, was that the Iranians stopped any effort to actually weaponize in, uh, five years ago, in 03, 04 and that they're not close to a bomb. I think uh, uh, Admiral Blair, the new uh, head of intelligence, Today. has said as much in the last few days again. Today. They're not, there's time. It doesn't mean they don't want a bomb. And frankly, if I were the Iranians listening to what Bush and Cheney have said about me, I'd want 500 bombs, but that's another story. <laughs> we never try to think of the consequences of our action. But the goal was to snatch scientists and get them to come and give false testimony to the American people. And the problem was, and what I'm telling you now, I don't know, um, uh, uh, I, I don't, what I'm saying is information I don't know empirically, like I know the earlier sentence. What I'm telling you now is I know heuristically from how they operate. If they happen to snatch somebody who did not want to do it, he wasn't long for life. I can just tell you that. The goal was to present false testimony. And I would argue that case, that notion, that kind of operation, I did not write all of that. Uh, in there because I had constraints. There, was, there were people then, it's now, it's then, and this, there's a new government. And um, I, I have actually gone inside and uh, made sure that, told people in the Obama, I'm just praying that they're getting all the briefings they need on it. They are getting briefings on it. And I can tell you right now, there were people inside the Obama administration that were appalled by what was going on inside Iran. I think when our nation was founded and the Constitution was developed and the Bill of Rights was adopted that as a nation, we made a decision. Yes, there would be problems with openness, but we were better off in the long run as a nation if we took the risk of the cost of openness rather than the risks of authoritarian government and closure of the public debate. And I think the verdict of American history is that was exactly the right choice to make and it's been a good one for us. Think Forward. Think Research Channel.